I, I talked about this uh, in Denver, and uh, it was kind of a conceptual talk, uh, uh, mentioning what has been done in the past. And at that point, I think we had just received a grant to install a phosphorus removal structure on a poultry operation. So I'm going to kind of go through the, the background of this a little faster and spend a little more time on what we've done in the last year. Um, Co-authors, Chad Penn, Josh McGrath, uh, Jeff Vitale, and uh, Delia Hawk. Um, we, this is a, a partnership between OSU. I guess I need to change that from University of Maryland to Kentucky now, because he's at Kentucky, right? So I missed that. Um, and Illinois River Watershed Partnership. You guys know this, but I, I want to just cover this real quickly about when I think of uh, phosphorus transport, you know, I try to separate it and uh, uh, particulate and dissolved. So obviously your particulate is going to be carried on eroded particles. Uh, it's not 100% uh, biologically available at the time. Um, and dissolved phosphorus being 100% biologically available. Uh, so that's the one that uh, we're kind of focusing on in this, in this presentation. And this is another illustration of legacy phosphorus. I kind of like this because it, similar to uh, Andrew's slide, it dates it over several years. Uh, we're looking at high application to corn fields. Your optimal phosphorus uh, level would be somewhere around here. And even after you uh, stop uh, adding fertilizer to these fields, you can see that we still have legacy phosphorus for, for several years, which that can uh, leak out into uh, the soil. And how we've uh, tackled this traditionally has been best management practices such as riparian areas, vegetative buffers, um, limiting phosphorus applications. Andrew talked some about that in our Uchi Spavanaugh watershed and Illinois River watershed. And, and those approaches do work. I think they work better for the particulate phosphorus and uh, maybe not as well for the uh, dissolved phosphorus. Uh, the dissolved phosphorus is a little harder to get a handle on. And um, so in these uh, high phosphorus soils, they're going to continue to produce this dissolved phosphorus for several years. So this is one tool in the toolbox, and I would like to you know, think of this as a combination that could be used along with the traditional BMPs like vegetative buffers. But uh, phosphorus sorbing materials can actually uh, chemically remove the dissolved phosphorus from a solution. Uh, examples include aluminum, iron, calcium, magnesium, and many of these uh, are byproducts that would normally go to a landfill. So if you could take something that's normally going to a landfill and recycle it, uh, I think of that as win-win. Um, they could be used for treating the manure, they could be used for treating the soil, but uh, we're not actually removing it from the system or from the watershed or from the farm. Um, I think a better choice would be to actually treat the runoff coming from these operations. Different phosphorus sorbing materials could be acid mine drainage residuals, they could be steel slag, that's what we kind of used in our case. Uh, drinking water treatment residuals, gypsum, fly ash. If you're not in an area with an industry, you may have manufactured uh, phosphorus sorbing materials. And there's obviously a selection process that goes along with, uh, with picking one of these. Um, is it available? Uh, if so, what's the cost? What does it cost to transport it? Does it have potential contaminants? Uh, if it passes that test, then we start looking at sorption characteristics and uh, hydraulic conductivity, um, which is sometimes hard to balance because you may have a material that has really good sorption characteristics, but the hydraulic conductivity is not very good. I want something that's going to sorb uh, phosphorus very well, but allow water to move through it uh, efficiently. This isn't rocket science. Um, essentially, you want to direct this high phosphorus water into this area. Think of it as a filter. And uh, it goes through a phosphorus sorbing layer. Uh, the phosphorus is sorbed to that uh, material. And then you have cleaner water that's coming out the, uh, the back end of this. The components that you would need uh, to build or develop one of these would be uh, the phosphorus sorbing material in sufficient quantity. Uh, you want a, a phosphorus rich water and uh, the ability to retain this phosphorus sorbing material so it doesn't wash away and uh, actually replace it. We're looking at replacing these about once every year or two. 
The advantages, you're removing both particulate and dissolved phosphorus, uh, more so on the dissolved side though. And uh, the idea behind this that, you know, Andrew talked about phosphorus sinks, uh, and at some point they're going to be contributing to uh, additional phosphorus to the waterways. Uh, in this case, you can actually remove it from that farming operation. You also could uh, see various metals and pesticides that are trapped within this as well. Applications include ag, urban, interfaces, and there's a lot of different structures out there. Uh, many of these that you're looking at uh, were developed on the East Coast with uh, Chad, or, uh, Chad and, and Josh McGrath. Um, here's a confined bed that uh, was installed a few years ago in, in a uh, golf course in Oklahoma. And uh, this is kind of a good illustration of a 150 acre uh, track where the water's essentially draining to this one spot right here. So I would consider this the hot spot. Uh, you have a forested area, a suburb, and then this is your golf course. And uh, then we place this structure right at that hot spot where the, uh, the water's running off. So as an example, this is a confined bed. It works really good as a large filter. Uh, it's ideal for uh, drainage swells that uh, require high peak flow. And uh, essentially you're, you're creating a shallow phosphor absorbing material with a large surface area so it can capture that peak flow. So if it's properly designed, you shouldn't be losing water around this. It should capture all that water. And this, I believe this handled water over uh, well over 100 gallons per minute. Box filters are just another design. Um, just to show you that there's many different shapes and forms of these. Uh, this is a vertically positioned uh, pipe inside a box, so it's a perforated pipe. This was filled with steel slag and uh, it could be used on ditches, uh, small ponds with overflows. The drawback is you have a small amount of material, which would at some point become saturated and you'll have to replace. Here's a tile drain filter system. Uh, basically, the gypsum and slag was uh, placed underneath and over these perforated pipes. Uh, in this case, you can dam it at the end to increase retention time, and uh, you can use a larger amount of material, relatively low cost. Storm drainage filters are another example. Uh, the drawback is uh, there's not much material that could be used in these. So design guidance, how do you figure out what is the best uh, type to build and what size? And th this is what uh, Chad Penn has been working on in his lab, where essentially he's testing different materials and uh, looking at lab flow through studies and looking at a pilot scale filter that we have on campus at OSU. And the idea is to, to test these materials. You're, you're adding phosphorus at a constant rate and you're measuring how much they're actually uh, absorbing. And then you could vary the retention time, you can vary the, the phosphorus concentration, and you're measuring what's coming out the outflow uh, and determining which ones work best. And then you can develop a, a model that uh, actually can give you predicted values on how much phosphorus this different material would remove. And here's the example of the pilot uh, scale filter at OSU. This is a nutrient-rich uh, retention pond, uh, some horticulture plots uh, up slope from it. So it gets a lot of nutrients that run off into this. And essentially this shed contains uh, a container where you have phosphorus absorbing material. We're pumping um, phosphorus rich water through that. And then you actually just measure inflow versus outflow, testing different material. In this case, this material was more effective at removing phosphorus than this material. And how the model can be used, uh, which has just been completed, is you visit a site, you, you survey it, you determine the hydrology, uh, annual flow, peak flow, slope, et cetera, and then you determine what's your targeted phosphorus removal. Are we looking at 50%, 60%, et cetera? And then you determine what material you're going to use. In this case, this is steel slag. So you would just say, okay, steel slag at a quarter inch, it has this porosity. Um, plug this into the, the model and it's going to uh, provide outputs so that you can 
design uh, structure. So it'll, it'll actually give you the design parameters. The software looks something like this. Um, and Chad is going to do a webinar on using this software. So if anybody's super interested in it, um, contact me afterwards. He's doing that Monday and next Friday. So you plug in some, some information, like I just mentioned, hydraulic conductivity, porosity of the material, and then it's going to give you an example of how many tons of material you'll need, the area required, the depth, um, the actual phosphorus removed, and uh, then you can use that to go out and build the structure. Um, here's an example of the model uh, where it's actually providing predicted values and then we'll go out and, and actually validate it with measure, measured values from the different structures that we have installed. So that's the really quick background and where I got involved on this is, is helping him get in contact with a poultry operation and design one for a poultry farm. I work with a, a producer that has uh, 154 houses. So think about that. 154 houses, great collaborator. He's always open for me to, to bring in new ideas and research and, and uh, work with, it, with him in any way. So uh, I said, hey, can we, uh, can we you know, install a phosphorus removal structure on, on a farm? And he said, yeah, I've got just the perfect farm. And he has one that he's not real happy with. Um, and in front of the barns, where you go open the door to clean out the litter, uh, inevitably you're going to have some spillage when you clean out a house. You know, you're looking at 150 tons you're cleaning out. Uh, if this is on some type of slope and you have a heavy runoff event, uh, that could channel off the farm. And in this case, it was going in a ditch. And the ditch was crossing a dirt road right here, going under a culvert, and going out into this nice vegetative buffer here. Uh, but you also have a stream there. So maybe we're capturing some of the particulate here. Um, I don't know how much of the dissolved we're, we're capturing though. This, this was a perfect spot to actually install one of these structures and that's what we did. The site conditions included um, nine acres at a 6% slope. The peak flow rate that we designed for was 1,000 gallons per minute. Uh, annual flow volume, nine acre feet. Typical dissolved phosphorus was up to two milligrams per liter. And I'll mention it, it wasn't all coming from the poultry operation. Um, the road here, I'm not really sure where it's coming from. I'm still trying to figure that out. But there, there's a hill here. So some of this runoff was coming from this road. And it can't be coming from these houses uh, unless it's from previous uh, litter applications or, or some other source. And, and I plan to take soil samples right here to try to determine where, what the source is, but we're getting pretty high levels of phosphorus just coming from the dirt road, so it's not all from the poultry operation. I just want to mention that. Um, the annual dissolved phosphorus load is around 50 pounds per year, and our goal was to remove 45 percent of that annual load. This is the angle of what's a side cutaway view. Uh, so we went 20 inches down, 33 inches in length. Uh, this is the, the farm is up here, downslope from the farm. So it's basically running in this direction. Uh, that's where we installed our, our structure, it was right here. And this is what the structure looks like. Upstream, here's a poultry operation. So on the other side of the tree is the road I spoke about. This is a house of the, the uh, uh, manager for the farm. So basically there's a culvert here and we're capturing it. Uh, we have perforated pipe that goes into these holes and uh, the perforated pipe runs to the end and it's surrounded by uh, 40 tons of uh, steel slag. And this is what it looks like after the steel slag is added to it. And to date we are capturing 67 percent of the dissolved phosphorus. Uh, trapped. Uh, the, the largest uh, event, or one of the events we had, we captured uh, 0.66 pounds of dissolved phosphorus from one stormwater event. Um, if you want to see a step-by-step -step process of this and, you know, follow it, go to p-structure.blogspot.com and I can show you that after the presentation if you want. 
Here's a hydrograph of a, a larger event where uh, we had a peak flow of up to close to 700 gallons per minute. Uh, the inflow range of phosphorus was anywhere from 2 to 11 milligrams of phosphorus per liter. And uh, from that one event, we removed 0.33 pounds of the 0.58 pounds of phosphorus that actually entered that structure. So we're capturing all of this even at a high event of 700 gallons per minute. Uh, we didn't have uh, water that wasn't going through that structure. And I, I just want to show you how you can use different materials to determine what, what to use and how to build your structure. Um, you know, for this particular site, we could have gone with a waste water treatment residual. We could have gone with an acid mine drainage residual. And you could see we would use less mass of it than using our steel slag down here. But you also have to consider uh, what's, the, what's the removal percentage for phosphorus. And it's pretty comparable for these two, you know, 37%, 50%, or with 45% steel slag. But then you come over and look at the hydraulic conductivity, and it's not really, it's not nearly as good as what we're getting with the steel slag. So in this case, yeah, we could have gone with an acid mine drainage residual, but our area would have been about five times the amount of area as we have with the steel slag. So for us, it made sense to go with the steel slag. It also depends on what you have locally available. The steel slag was free, we just paid for the shipping cost on it. The next steps, uh, the software has been completed um, and uh, it's basically an interactive guidance where you provide inputs and it provides outputs for, uh, for parameters. Uh, we're licensing the software uh, NRCS is, is going to develop a standard, uh, which as soon as we get the software online, um, that'll be a cost share standard available. Um, and uh, commercialization is going to be key. Uh, basically, someone coming in, accessing the, the uh, software, and then use it to go out and, and build these structures for anyone that's interested. Potential uses, uh, several, you know, golf courses, homeowner associations, uh, stormwater management, ag, and in our area, EPA is interested in, in uh, developing TMDLs for the Illinois River watershed, so this could be a tool in the toolbox for that. Uh, thinking more on the horizon or long term, nutrient credit, credit brokers uh, would be another uh, example. So with that, that's my 30 minute talk condensed into 15 minutes. Uh, ended it with a picture of the Illinois River we mentioned earlier we're seeing trends of phosphorus declining. Uh, every time I've floated this, it's always been a very beautiful scenic river. I, I don't see green slime floating down it. Um, you can see the bottom, so I, I like to float it and fish it. And uh, plug to Arkansas for, for helping with those efforts and, and conservation and education efforts that we've done in uh, Oklahoma as well. And we talked about the, uh, the litigation of the poultry industry, so the new joke now is why did the chicken cross the stream? And, uh, I think it's to avoid creating a water quality violation. So 